So today we are excited. It's raining. I love the sound of rain. I've missed the sound of rain. It's, it's been beautiful just hearing that. Not just today, but uh, for the last several weeks. And uh, it's good to see you all here today. I can tell you May is going to be a good month. Amen? Yeah. May is going to be a good month. And, uh, and before I get ahead of myself, uh, there's something that I, I'd like uh, to do at this point. Uh, there's, uh, there's a girl here, uh, I wanted to call her a little girl, uh, who is no longer little, uh, who would like to say something before uh, I, I continue with the sound. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah, and I'm a girl. I am not little, <laughs> um, but I am a girl. I am... Um, I am the daughter of Pastor Edward Kunene, and the reason I wanted to come up and speak today is because I am leaving for college tomorrow, and, <laughs> and um, I just wanted to say a few things to the church. So the first thing I want to say is thank you to every single one of you for being here, for coming, whether today is your first time or you've been here for years. Um, you being here is proof that uh, this was not a mistake. That my dad didn't approve my mom, my sister and I from a very comfortable life to come here and start from scratch for nothing. You being here proves that everything that has happened so far, not just in my family's life but in my life as well, has not been a mistake. Um, my sister and I like to joke and say there are three kids in the family. There's me, her and ICC. And it's been really cool to see the church grow. I have seen um, people come in to go get married, have babies. I have seen, you know, um, their, kid, their parents here whose babies are used to go, and now I teach them in certain routines. And it's been amazing to watch the church grow and to find friends and to find parents and friends. And it's been incredible and I just want to say thank you because you are living proof that God has a plan and a purpose for everything. And that gives me hope that even as I start my life on my own, that I will be okay as long as I put my trust in Him. So thank you for supporting me, for being there for me, for encouraging me. Sometimes it's just a hug, sometimes it's just, Sarah, how are you? But it means the world. And yeah, that's all I wanted to say. I'd like us to go ahead and lift up our hands to our Sarah and pray for her. Sarah goes to the Pan African Christian University where she will be studying. <laughs> I've been warned not to say what she'll be studying, so let me not say that. And uh, she told me not to touch her because she will cry, so I'll not touch her. Uh, but I'd like us to just stretch our hands to her and pray for her and bless her as she goes, as she begins this next phase of her life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Sarah. We thank you for her love for you. We thank you for the way that she has grown in your wife, in your will, in your ways. We thank you, Lord, for her desire to, to live fully for you. And even more than once she's going to start here now, we pray that you will hold her hand and you will hold her For the time that she will be away from God, because this is all. We pray that God should continue to soar, to walk with you, to know you. May you surround the Lord with a church family that you will not have to care for that. And we will support and encourage at the Lord of God. We pray that you will make your face to shine upon and you will give her your peace. And we pray that the joy of the Lord shall always be us. Lord, in times when she is discouraged, we pray that you will encourage her. In times when she is homesick, that you will know your presence. Because home is indeed where the presence of God is. I pray that Father, she will experience that. that, that. Just like the Sima who sang and said that, that 
in, in your presence or, or your presence is heaven to them. I pray that sorrow will experience that heaven, that presence of the living God for the worship place. I pray that Lord, you will continue to cause us to thrive in you, in your purposes, in your way, and in your heaven. For we bless her today, and we pray minister to her in future, beyond our wildest imaginations. We entrust her into your hands, Father. As a church, we, we commit her into your hands, and we pray, Father, go with her. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just thinking about today and asking uh, me not to touch her and all, she would actually cry. She, she would begin to cry. Um, yeah. But I praise and I bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise and I bless the Lord. Yeah. Well, she never. Um, some of you know what Sarah is going to study. Um, so she said, I don't need to keep repeating it. Uh, some people already know she, she's going to Pan African Christian in Baptist. She'll be studying Bible and theology. Um, yeah, they say like Father, like daughter. I don't care what your version says. That's, that's, that's my version. Amen. Yeah. But, uh, uh, allow me to also say, you know, we take her to college tomorrow. Uh, but then I'll not be coming back because I have a two weeks mission trip to the nation of East Timor. Um, and so I'll be, I'll be there training leaders, equipping leaders, uh, preaching in all kinds of meetings. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting, it, it, it's good. It's time for you to know where East Timor is. You know, um, it's, it's a tiny nation. Um, right uh, on the southern tip of uh, Indonesia. Uh, that, that's why East Timor is. And uh, I told a friend of mine that I'm going there, and the first thing they asked me is, is it safe? Because for the longest time, there's been all kinds of fights uh, over East Timor. Uh, but I believe it is, uh, because uh, peace is not the absence, uh, it is not the presence of war, it's the, but the presence of God. And so as long as the Lord is there, I'll be well. And we will see you definitely um, two weeks later. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, let's get into the Word of God. Let's get into the Word of God. And as we do so on this beautiful Sunday morning here in Mombasa, um, I'm excited to be introducing a new sermon series uh, to us. And I'm glad we are all here to be able to, to, to get it. We are all here. Uh, to be able to receive this and uh, please help me here I'd, I'd like you to help me here to just turn around to two or three people right around where you are shake their hand in fact let's increase that to uh, four or five people uh, right around where you are shake their hand and uh, we'll come them to international christian center mombasa and you know the polite thing to do the polite thing to do is to go ahead and get to know their name come on now you can do that judge shake the hand of two three four five people and get to know them by name. Find out who they are. Ask them um, what their name is. I tell you, it's a beautiful sight to see people shaking hands and, and coming around and just saying hi to people. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. I love it. I, I love seeing the smiles on your faces, the connections, the eyes, uh, the greetings. It's a beautiful, beautiful sight. It's a beautiful, beautiful sight. Thank you for doing that. Um, I, I'm sure God loves it. It's not just me who loves what you've just done. I'm sure God loves it too. Because you know, the Bible discourages. The Bible discourages us from hanging out by ourselves. You know, just hanging out by ourselves, being by ourselves. The Bible discourages it. And uh, the, uh, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse number 1, according to the message translation, it says, Loners who care only for themselves spit on the common good. 
Did you hear that? Loners who care only for themselves speak on the common good. And so I am so grateful that the people here were not speaking on the common good. That you do not just hang out by yourself. You're not a loner right there. You got to shake people's hands and get to know uh, who they are. And, and that's a beautiful thing. That, that a different translation of the same uh, verse, uh, according to the NLT, the Bible says, unfriendly people care only about themselves. Unfriendly people care only about themselves. They lash out at common sense. And so when you shake hands, when you become friendly, not unfriendly, but friendly, you're actually uh, being a blessing and, uh, and uh, you care about common sense. You're a uh, blessing, touching, ministering to other people. And, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Amen? I encourage us to be a people that, that, that show ourselves friendly, that, that step out, that touch, that minister, that make uh, a difference in the lives of others. In fact, allow me to say this. This is the reason why I asked you to get to know the name of that other person. Uh, is because this week, I'd like you to be their personal intercessor. I'd like you to pray for them. You have no idea what people go through. You know, sometimes we show up at church and uh, we are all uh, dressed up and uh, we have our Sunday smile on, we have our Sunday hair, we, we have our Sunday uh, dressing, our Sunday shoes, and, and people can't tell the battles that we are facing, the stuff that we are going through. Isn't it? That happens. That, that you can be going through the worst season of your life and you show up in, uh, in church on a Sunday morning with a smile. With a smile. Where the world beats us is because when somebody is discouraged and they show up at, at a club, for example, they show up discouraged. And everyone gets to know what is going on in their lives. And people are able to come up and, and grab their shoulder and tap them on the, you know, pat them on the shoulder and say, you know what, you're not alone. We are together in this. Whatever it is that you're facing, you know, and, and they rally around one another. It happens, uh, you know, in chamas and, uh, you know, when people gather together in their homes or other places uh, for other kinds of meetings. But when we show up at church, we put on this Christian, no one knows what, and what we are going through. And it's a reason why people say that church is full of hypocrites. We're not hypocrites. It's just that, you know, we have, we've been taught to have a Sunday face. And as we uh, begin this sermon series, I'd like you to do something here. That, uh, 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 you know, I'd like you to drop the pose. Drop, you know, that masquerade. And just be real. Be real. I'll tell you what the sermon series is in just a moment if you have not caught it yet. Are we together? If you have not caught it yet, but that person that told you their name, please, this week, pray for them. Commit to pray for them. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way uh, till Sunday. We will not be unfriendly people. We will not just care about ourselves. We will ensure that we care about others also. Amen? Amen. We will do that. In fact, the sermon series that we are beginning today uh, and I believe it's going to richly bless you and minister to you and uplift you uh, in, in every area of your life. I believe that this Summon series will uh, just change the quality of your life. Uh, we are calling this Summon series Friend Request. Friend Request. And we are saying that the quality of our friendships, the quality of our friendships determines the quality of our lives. The quality of our friendships determines the quality of our lives. Let that just sink in for a moment. It's the quality of your friendships that greatly impact the quality of your life, how you live, the things that you pursue, and the things that you do. This means that if you don't like the quality of your life, then you should change your friends. If you don't like what is going on right now, most probably um, you need to change your friends. They say that birds of a feather flock together. Birds of a feather flock together. And, and the Bible says that you two cannot walk together not unless they be agreed. And so for you to be walking together with somebody going in that direction, you agree with them. You agree with their habits. You agree with the stuff that they do and the way that they live their life. Somebody else said that show me your friends and I will show you who you really are. 
if I can see your friends, I'll begin to tell what kind of a person you are. Hanging out with the wrong crowd will soon cause you to be the wrong crowd. And hanging out with the right crowd will cause you to begin thinking, talking, living like the right crowd. You see, what we are saying, what we are saying in this sermon series, and what I'm saying to us today, is that friendships are important. So important and critical that we need to carefully think through the friend requests that we receive. That we need to think through the friend requests that we receive, the friend requests that we are accepting and give, getting ourselves connected to. And uh, I'm not just talking about social media here, even though uh, that that's, uh, is a big deal in this day and age. It's a big deal in this day and age. Several years ago, I was visiting a certain guy uh, because uh, for, for, for a number of, of days, his name had kept on coming to my mind. And, and I would pray for him, and I felt the bad end of the Lord that I needed to visit him. And so I went, uh, you know, to, to uh, his workplace. We got to hang out. We are talking and, um, and, and sharing. And I couldn't tell what was the problem. You know, I, I, I kept asking, you know, I'm praying. Uh, I'm asking the Lord, why? Why have you been laying this uh, person in my heart? And I knew he was in trouble, but he had all the right words. Are you getting me? That, does that, that ever happen to you? You sit down with somebody, you're talking, and you're sharing, and you're asking questions, and they're answering, and, and uh, you can't tell what is wrong, but you can tell something is wrong. You can't pinpoint it, but you know something is wrong. Because we tend to, well, we know the language, we know the words to use, we know how to put phrases together. In fact, right now, if I ask, how are you doing? You know the answer to give. You don't even think about it. Oh, I'm fine. I'm good. Isn't it? We do that all the time. Let's try it. How are you? <laughs> well, somebody, somebody has at least, like, you know, begun to change the script. They're hungry. You know, and... Uh, <laughs> but that's, you can be dying, and when somebody asks you, you know what to say. Oh, I'm doing well. Our oh, life has been good. And you know life has not been good. You know you're facing, a, you know, the craziest season of your life, but life is good. I, I'm, I'm okay. I am okay. And so that conversation went on, and uh, I, I began asking the Lord, you know, now that I can't seem to get what is it that is the problem, would you create an opportunity? Would you show me? Would you show me? And uh, it happened that uh, this person, uh, uh, you know, wanted to show me something on their Facebook page. And uh, so I, I got a hold of their laptop and, and I went to the Facebook page. And, uh, you know, what I saw, what I saw is the kind of stuff that makes you want to shut down the computer, throw it away, begin screaming, you know, um, because it was vulgar, it was lewd. Conversations that were going on and pictures that were on, on, on his Facebook feed were the kind of stuff that you don't want to ever see in your life. And he was so embarrassed when he noticed that I'd, I'd seen that, you know, because our eyes move. You, you can be showing me one line, but I, I can't stop myself from seeing everything else. Uh, are you getting me? And so he got so embarrassed. Uh, and, and I quickly, you know, I didn't even read. I quickly pushed the computer away. I didn't want to even face it. And so I looked at him and I asked, you know, what, what's up? We began to talk about it. And you know what his excuse was? His excuse was, Facebook is so dirty. And I confronted him. And I said, no, Facebook is not dirty. Social media is not dirty. It's the friendships that you respond to that determine the quality of your feed. Are you getting me? There are people who, if you open their Facebook feed, you will feel like you're entering heaven. Oh, hallelujah. I mean, because they're talking about God, they're talking about what God is saying, they have worship music, 
uh, you know, uh, beginning to play and all. I am so grateful for, for, for that kind of, of feed, you know, that, that you open your Facebook and you have no problem with videos running by themselves without you clicking play. Because you're sure there is nothing crazy that is going to come up. It's the quality of your friends or the quality of the friend request that you're responding to that determines the quality of your feed. And so we began to talk about that. We began to talk about that. And, and I came to the place where I, I made some statements to him. And, and I'm making a statement to us this morning. You can write it down, this down. I am saying to us today, how you respond to God always determines the kind of life you will live. Just like we have said, just like I told this gentleman, it's the friend request you respond to that determines the quality of your feed. Even for us, when it comes to this one key friendship, because God is the, is the number one friendship that we are supposed to have in our lives. And, and so how we respond to him determines the quality, the kind of life that we will live. You see, friends, it, it's the friendships that you and I respond to that determine the quality of our feet, what we are feeding on, what we are receiving, and what even we are releasing and giving out. Because I love, I love the Facebook feed, you know, that, that whatever it is that is there is, is really the friends that you accepted. You will never receive anything from me, even if I post every day, even if I post every 10 minutes, you will never see anything that I post if you are not my friend. Are you hearing me? And the only way you will see it is if my posts are public and then you have a friend who is my friend and they like it or they repost it or they share it. Are, are you getting what we're saying? And so your feed is going to be determined by the friends that, that you have responded to. And I don't know whether you noticed in the video that played just before I came out, you know, that that person was accepting all the friend requests that were there simply based on uh, how many friends do we have in common. But that's not a very good measure. That's not a very good measure of, of who to respond to. I don't know, maybe they were looking at the friends we share in common. Because there are some friends that, that when, when I see who we are friends in common, that then I can begin to tell the quality of what I will receive. But then I also came to the place of realizing that, that uh, you know, and especially on social media, that uh, you know, we can, be, we, you can, we can be having very many good friends in common, but you are not necessarily a good friend. You didn't catch what I said. Have you ever responded to God's friend request? Have you ever responded to his request for you to seek him a little bit more? To hear his voice, to walk in obedience to his leading. Just imagine if we were as quick to respond to God, turn to him, seek him, and, and seek after his leading and direction the same way we respond quickly to the friend requests that we receive on social media. Just imagine how our lives would be if we wanted his likes. You know, that God liked something that you did. That God liked something that you say. That God liked the picture that he's seeing from you. The same way you want people to like your photos on social media. I can tell you, when you put up a photo and then you come back later and you find a hundred people have liked it, 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 it it's the way it makes you feel. True or false? I know we... We, we are vain people, but, but yeah, it's true. A hundred people like my photo. Or you post up a comment, a, a statement you came up with, you do not even copy somewhere, you just thought through. And then you posted it up. And, and you come back two hours later, it has 250 likes. And there are 50 people who have commented and said, oh yes, so true, so sharp. You, 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 you are so... <laughs> You're pouring wisdom like rain. <laughs> you know, you umongea kama waze watano. It makes you feel nice, isn't it? But what if we sought after God's likes and God's comments and God's...
and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well, what if we sought after God's comments and likes and, and repost the way we pursue? Yeah, because God can repost. You live in such a way and, and, and he just tells Pastor Stratton, you know, I need you to go to so and so to pray for you or to encourage you. I mean, remember Ananias? Just a normal, regular human being living his life in, in Damascus and then Paul for, you know, Saul of Tarsus falls by the side of the road. Jesus appears to him and then he tells him, now go to Damascus and Ananias will come and pray for you. I can assure you, Paul, as an apostle, never forgot the guy who prayed for him. We don't know much about him, but at least we know he's a man that prayed for Paul of Tarsus. And his scales fell off and the Holy Spirit came upon him. That in your life, whatever it is, the way you're living, what is going on in your life, that, that if there were any likes, you just have one like from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that one like is enough. You're like, you know what? This is it. This is enough. I am okay. I am, I am okay. I am okay. Just imagine if we are quick to go after God like we go after those messages, those texts, those WhatsApp. And those calls. You see, the quality of our lives will be so radically different. It will be so radically different. The quality of our lives will be out of this world, literally. Because we will be living from the perspective of heaven, not the perspective of earth. How we respond to God always determines the kind of life that we will live. Jesus taught us to pray. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Here on earth, as it is in heaven. That's a, that's a life that we are supposed to live. We are supposed to live in such a way that we are pleasing heaven and changing earth. Did you hear me? I know we love uh, phrases like those. And so, why don't you go ahead and just say it uh, to, to the person next to you. Just tell them, live in such a way that you are pleasing heaven and changing earth. Not the other way around. Not pleasing earth and displeasing heaven. You see, the Bible actually tells us that Jesus has made a friend request to you and to me. It's been posted. It's available. Turn together with me so that you may see where it is. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 20. There's a friend request that has been made to every one of us. Is a friend request that have been made uh, uh, to us, every one of us. Revelation 3, verse number 20. I've preached this verse many times out in the crusades and, and other places until one day I realized that this verse is actually primarily to the church, not to the unchurched. And so I began preaching it in church. It's up on the screen. I'd like to go ahead and just read it out to us. Here is a friend request. Uh, Jesus says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. It doesn't end there. Um, all right, according to that version, ends there. Uh, this is what it says in a different uh, version. It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. As friends. I will come in. I will come in. We'll be friends. It's a friend request that has been made. And that's the, uh, the, the, that's the, the meaning when, when, when you read that scripture uh, in, in the context of, of, of the Greek. That Jesus wants to be friends with you. He doesn't want to come and, and just check out and see what is it that you have. Oh, you have a, a 21 inch a TV or you have a, a 32. Or maybe you are one of those guys who love big screens. You have, a, uh, you have a 72 inch screen in your house. Wow! That's not what he's interested in coming and seeing. He, he wants to be friends with you. He has made a friend request to you. He is standing at the door. He's knocking. He wants to come in. He wants to begin to do life with you. He wants to begin to do life with you. It's the one, number one most important friend request you will ever receive on planet Earth. Jesus told the disciples, I do not, I no longer call you servants. 
Why? Because I call you friends. You are my friends. I want friendship with you. I want to walk with you and, and teach you what I know and, and, and see how you're living your life. I want us to influence one another. I want to release you so that you may go and do exactly what I, I would have done. I want you to flock with me. Birds of a, flag, uh, a, a, a feather flock together. In fact, it's not right to call yourself a Christian if you're not friends with Jesus. Let me explain. Part of a feather flock together, when, when, when you go with him, when you're walking with him, it, you know, he begins to influence you. You begin to talk like him. You begin to do things like him. You begin to think like him. That's what happened in Antioch. And they got to the place where the Bible tells us in Antioch, they were first called Christians. Why? They were Christ-like. When people looked at them, I, I'm not saying these uh, uh, in, in any demeaning way to the Lord, uh, the, to our Lord and Savior. But, but it's as though the people of Antioch began to see little Jesuses walking everywhere. Remember, Stephen, you can tell that he was a friend of Jesus. Why? Even when he was being stoned, he spoke like him. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Sing just like him. Just like him. And that simply says he had been with Jesus. The disciples, Peter and John, when, when they were arrested by the Sanhedrin and then they were beaten, you know, uh, and, and then brought uh, up and, and they were being questioned. One of the things that the Sanhedrin observed, the leaders in Jerusalem observed, is that they had been with Jesus. In other words, the friendship with Jesus was something ob observable. They could observe, they could tell, these men have been with Jesus. They noticed that they were idiots, or they, they were, you know, unschooled. They, they, they noticed that. They noticed that they were poor, common people, but they also noticed that they had been with Jesus. That, you're, that when people see you, whether it be at your workplace, in the estate, wherever it is that people see you, they will begin to notice that there's a friend request that you have responded to. How you respond to God will always determine the kind of life that you live. People will begin to tell. People will begin to see. In fact, I'd like you to say this. I'd like you to say this in, in just a moment. Uh, because I'm making this invitation to us today as we are beginning to dig into this uh, someone series, friend request. And, and today we are talking about our friendship with God. In the coming days, we'll talk about all kinds of friendships. But here is the thing that I'd like you uh, to just observe. You see, if you respond to this friend request, the quality of your feed will change. Your life will change. Your stories and testimonies will change. You begin to talk about things that people look at you and they say, yeah, there's something different about you. Something has radically changed about you. And my question is, will you? Will you accept? Will you respond to this friend request? Will you say yes and say, I'm choosing, yes, I am choosing to come in, uh, you know, uh, to, to fellowship and to know God. I, I am choosing to say yes, that he can come in and dine with me and, and fellowship with me and walk with me and talk with me and change and transform me for his kingdom purposes. You see, when I accept that one friend request, my timeline will change. The stories on my timeline will change. And what is my, my timeline? It's not just that feed on Facebook. It's a timeline. The, the, the time that God has given me on planet Earth, my story will begin to change. What you're reading, what you're seeing from me on a daily basis will begin to change. That the way I spend money will begin to change. The places that I go will begin to change. The stories that I share with people will begin to change. I'll get to the place where I can't help myself but talk about this Jesus who has transformed and changed everything about me. This one friendship will change everything about me. And so I call us today to change our feeds. Have a makeover as we respond to this key friendship. Please say with me the, the following statement. It's a, just a twist of the, st the statement I gave you earlier. It says, how I respond to God always determines the kind of life I will live. How I respond to God always determines the kind of life I will live. Thank you. Genesis 18 from verse number 1 to 15. I'd like us to go in there. Genesis 18, verse number 1, all the way to verse number 15. I'd like us to go in there. We are reading, and as we read, I want you to notice some things about this man, Abraham. The Bible says he's a father of faith. 
what made him the father of faith? What, what was so special and different about this man? Genesis 18, from verse number 1 to verse number 15. The Bible says this, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. So the Lord appears to Abraham. How does he do it? Verse number 2. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. Uh, I'd like to just pause there for a moment. God appeared to Abraham. But it's interesting that God doesn't go into the tent of Abraham. He stands nearby. He stands nearby because Abraham needs to respond. God has come, but Abraham needs to respond. And, and I've looked <laughs> at many scriptures in the Bible and I've noticed many times this is what God does. He just comes. He just comes. And it's for you to respond to him. You need to respond to him. You know, he came in a burning bush. He was coming to Moses. He was coming to Moses in the burning bush. But rather than walk up to Moses and begin to talk to him, God just comes upon the burning bush. And so Moses had to be attracted. He had to see the bush that, that was on fire, but it was not burning up, and decide, let me go and see what is going on here. Are you getting me? That's what God does. You know, and, and I went through the scriptures, that just reading different places, and, and I was like, why do you do this? Why do you do this? Because you see, just like Jesus said in, in, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse number 20, you know, all he can do in knock is knock, do something. But it's for you to open the door and invite him in. And so he stands nearby. Okay? And, and I know there have been all kinds of discussions about, uh, you know, God came, but why are they three? Uh, some people say it was uh, the Lord and two angels. Some people say it was the Trinity. Uh, you know, that's not the basis of this sermon. And so I'll, I'll not spend arguments on it. All I know is that the Bible says in verse number one that the Lord appeared to Abraham. Isn't it? The Lord appeared to Abraham. Uh, he appeared in three, uh, uh, in, in, in three men, um, but let's not spend time on that. When he saw them, when he saw the three men, he saw the three men, he hurried from the end to the ground. And so uh, Abraham responded. And he doesn't just stand slowly and go to check who they are. Are you seeing what he did? How did he respond? He hurried. In other words, he moved quickly to go and uh, get the men. And so he bows down, he greets them. Verse number three, uh, he's not just there to greet them. Uh, but this is Abraham. He's saying, if I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, not my Lord's, but my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Uh, verse number four. And, and so he asks, you know, don't, don't just stand here. Do not pass by me. Why, why don't you do something? Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. And so he welcomes them. He welcomes them. He says, I'd like to wash, uh, to give you some water to wash your feet. But that's not all that he's planning to do. He, he tells them it's water, but look at what he does. Verse number five. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way. Now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. Verse number six. I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, looking at the verses. I just want to keep going. So Abraham hurried to the tent. He does it again. Is it that Abraham never knew how to go slowly? Are you getting me? But we know there are times when he did move quickly. But, but this time round, in this chapter, the verses that we are reading, he's not taking time. He's not doing things at his own pace. He is doing it and doing it quickly. He's doing it quickly. He hurried into the tent uh, to Sarah. Quick, he said, quick. I love that. He said, get three sears of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Go ahead and do it. He doesn't ask her, what food do we have in the house? What is it that we have planned to eat? What is it that is available? Abraham has a menu. He knows what he's going to offer. He knows what it is that he's going to offer. Then he ran to the heart and selected a choice. That means one of the best. A choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who had him to prepare it. And, you know, and, and so he picks uh, his best 
calf and he says, here, prepare this. But he doesn't stop there. He's not just giving people instructions. Look at what he does. He then brought some cards and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set those before them. So who got the milk and, and the card? Some versions of the Bible actually says he, he got yogurt. Come on now. Yes. He, he got yogurt and bread. And, and the calf that have been prepared, in other words, the meat is already prepared. And he said this before them. When they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Now, in their culture, in their culture, in those days, they, they would literally prepare the milk as uh, when, when they need it. They would put it, uh, in, you know, a, either in, in, in a container and just shake it until it, it gets ready. And that's why he's taking the milk and together with the bread and the calf at the same time because he gave instructions but he quickly got something also that he's doing and he prepares that and then he takes them he does not allow the servant he does not ask Sarah to do it it's Abraham himself who does it it's Abraham himself who does it why am I focusing on this because this is how Abraham responded to the God of heaven and earth and many times this is how he used to re respond when God would show up there was a difference in the way Abraham responded to the God of heaven and earth the times that he appeared to him. And so he begins to teach us how to respond to God's friend request. He, just back to verse number 8, let me finish uh, reading that. He comes with, with the food, he's the one who's carrying it, and he sets before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. A different version of the Bible says he stood there waiting on them. If you need water, I'll pour for you. If you need another glass of yogurt, I'll pour it for you. If you need uh, some, some extra meat, maybe the, 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 the pieces are, are too big, I'll cut it into smaller pieces for you. Whatever it is that you need, and, and uh, if, uh, uh, allow me to just say this uh, as, as, a, as a joke, I need to uh, uh, you know, just make fun of Pastor Stratton here. Uh, he's been away for a whole month. You know, in in uh, Justin Campus, he's back, and so how else can we know he's back? You know, it's just making fun of him the whole time. Um, you know, <laughs> if they were like uh, uh, Pastor Stratton, you know, when they ask for some pili pili, some chili, you know, that's what he does every time we go and eat. Uh, uh, once we begin eating, he asks, you know, uh, is there chili? You know, get me some chilies, and he doesn't take the bottled stuff. He takes the green ones, you just cut into pieces. I'm, I'm giving you leakage when he becomes visiting. You know, and some, and some lemon. And some lemon. How many have ever gone and eaten with Pastor Stratton? Who will agree with me? That, that's what he does. I see quite a number of hands. Yeah, see? Uh, I'm not the only one. People agree. Uh, and so just get chili. If he says he's coming to visit, you, you know what to do. Just get some chili. You know, whatever it is, whether it's dengu or uh, the chapati, ugali, and, and, and beef, you will always add chili. You know? and, and so if they were adding chili, Abraham was right there. Right there, ready to add chili. And in, July, uh, in June, you remind me, I'll, I'll be uh, making fun of Sheila because she is in... Uh, uh, destiny this camp uh, th this month she's the one who's preaching there so uh, just remind I need to be dissing everyone who goes you know just making fun of them because they're good people I mean when you're away if you call you for a whole month uh, when you come back we welcome you you know uh, we make fun of you yeah uh, and uh, yeah, you know they don't have a snack bar although their snacks they are free I encourage you you need to go and hang out <laughs> Um, and, and so Abraham made sure the chilies were there, the limao was available, whatever it is that was needed was available. Now, um, I, I don't know how they would teach this uh, someone to children's church because the children will ask, do you mean God either takes yogurt? <laughs> because he did, he ate. Alright? Uh, if you don't believe me, next verse. Uh, he did, he ate. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. You know, and so the, the, the wife is uh, in the tent, uh, she didn't come out, that means Abraham is the one who served and everything. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the uh, entrance to the tent, which was behind uh, him. Um, and, and so the, the tent is behind the person speaking. 
and she's j just there listening. Um, I, I don't know, is that something women do? You know, uh, <laughs> they listen at the tent door. You don't see them, but they're there, they're hearing the conversation. <laughs> the, the interesting thing with the Lord is, uh, even if you assume he's not seeing you, uh, he's hearing, he can, he can even hear your heart. Abraham and Sarah were already very old. Sarah was past the age of childbearing. And uh, so Sarah laughed at, to herself as she thought, this is a thought. After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? You know, the pleasure of having a child and all? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And say, will I really have a child now that I am old? And so the Lord can hear your thoughts. Even when you don't speak. What a friend. There is a friend who can know what it is that I'm thinking in my heart. What is going on in my mind. And when you came to church today, you might be seated here, and you think no one cares, no one knows you, no one knows what is going on in your life. He does. He does. Even when you receive a prophetic word or, or something is declared over your life or somebody prays uh, for you when your hand is lifted up and you're thinking, well, I've done this so many Sundays, I don't think anything will happen. God hears. He knows. He knows. And this is a friend. No wonder the Bible says he sticks closer than a brother. Because he's a friend who knows you completely and yet still loves and cares for you. He knows what you're thinking uh, right now. He knows what you've been thinking the whole morning. He knows at the point in the worship when, when your mind moved away from worship and focusing on him and you began, began thinking about uh, the clothes that you washed yesterday that you need tomorrow and they have not yet dried in this rain. He knows all that. Are you getting it? He knows all that. What a friend we have in Jesus. Is anything too hard for the Lord? This is, I, 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 let me read verse number 13 again. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Mm -hmm. Next verse. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. He goes on to affirm what he has just said. Now the interesting thing is, um, you know, nothing is hard for the Lord. Maybe you're going through stuff and, and, and uh, you've been feeling as though you, you don't know how to, to deal with it. Struggles, challenges, situations that are not making sense and you don't know what to do. You are desperate and you came to church today wondering, you know, will this Sunday be different? Let me tell you this, nothing is hard for our Lord. There is nothing he cannot be able to do. And I pray right now that our God may minister to you and meet you in that situation of need, that place where you're doubting, where you don't have faith, where, where, where you are shaken and you don't think God can be able to do something about it. Maybe it's something that has persisted over many months. I pray right now that God may release his power over that situation and, and just cause you to know that he loves and cares for you. I pray for his miraculous power in your life. I pray for the release of the Holy Spirit in your life to work out his purposes. Your friend knows you. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going through. And I pray that he may come through and make a way. Amen. And I declare to you today, just like he declared to Abraham and Sarah this time next year, I pray that God will do it. I pray that God will give you that child that you've been longing for and trusting and believing for. That that, that that dream that God gave you, that you're wondering when will it ever be accomplished, I pray that it will come to pass before this time next year. I pray that God will show up in your life. That it will change and transform your business. Because uh, as I said earlier, when you respond to his friend request, your timeline changes. I pray right now that the God who is almighty, the God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly, far above all that we can ever ask or think of, according to his power that is at work in our lives, I pray that he may change your timeline. Amen. Would you look at the person next to you and tell them, how do you respond to God will change your timeline? Amen. And may your timeline change completely. Are we together? May your timeline change completely. Uh, verse number 15, and I am done. Uh, Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did. Yes, you did laugh. And I pray that you will stop lying. You will stop putting up a face and behaving as, all, as though all is well, even though you know that people are living as though everything is okay. Instead of saying, you know what, pray for me. 
believe God with me, stand with me, encourage me. And I pray that every one of us will begin pointing everyone else towards God so that we may respond to Him. So that we may respond to Him. Three things that we see in this text, uh, uh, in this text as, we, as we read through. I'm not even going to spend a lot of time in them because I've already alluded to a lot of them. Just look at the way Ab Abraham responded to God. Number one, he was quick to invite God in. He was quick to invite God in. Abraham sees the three visitors and notice the words that, that are used in, in the scripture. We already did that. He runs, he hurries. Another version says he quickly goes and invites them in. You see, to Abraham, it seems as though, and it is true, that friendship with God was everything. It was everything to him. And I pray that you and I will come to that place where we we'll begin to view our friendship with God, with God as everything. He will become the one that we respond to quickly, without delay. Because we cannot wait to respond to God when we want, or when we have time, or, or when we think that, that, that it is okay. That we will respond to Him quickly. When He convicts us of sin, we will repent. When He points us in a direction, we will go in that direction. When He asks us to do something, we will do it, and we will do it quickly. We will be a people that respond quickly to the Lord and all that He desires of us. My friend, for us to live the kind of life that God wants of us, we've got to learn to respond to Him quickly. When he calls, the who will answer quickly. Remember the prophet Samuel. God calls Samuel, Samuel. And he rises up quickly and he runs to Eli. And he says, here I am, you called. And Eli says, no, I did not call you. And he goes back and he calls, the Lord calls him a second time and he comes running. You know, and, and, and he kept doing that. There is no point he thought, you know what, I've gone these two times and, and, and nothing happened. I, I'm not going to go this time round. No, if he had done that, you'd have missed out on God's friend request to him. But because he kept responding and responding quickly without delay, when the Eli told him, next time you hear it, simply say, Lord, here I am. And God will be able to speak to you. And, and I pray that that will be your response. That you respond to God quickly. You don't develop an attitude. You know, I, I pray and I fast. That God, you asked me to fast. And I did and nothing happened. Or you woke me up in the middle of the night to pray. And I've been waking up in the middle of the night these four nights to pray. And nothing is changing in my life, my friend. Let me tell you this. Respond and respond quickly to the God of heaven and earth when he calls. Amen. When he comes, when he shows up, when he desires of you to walk with him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. Notice that Abraham had been trusting and waiting upon God for a son. Abraham and Sarah had been waiting on God for a son. God had given them a promise. But it was when he responded to God and invited him, invited him in. And he did it quickly and went on to do the other things that I'm about to mention. That is the time when all has been said and done. That's when God said, this time next year. All before, it was just a promise. You will be a father of many nations. But on this particular day, it stopped being a promise. It became a marker in his timeline. I told you, it's how you respond to him that begins to make a difference in the timeline. At that point in time, God said, this time next year. And if it was a post on Facebook, the following year, there would have been a memory that would have popped up. Are you getting me? Yes. There would have been a memory that popped up. And I pray that God will cause there to be all kinds of memories that begin to pop up in your life. Those things that God spoke to you. As you choose to respond to him this month, I pray for a bathing. I pray for a bathing that they will move from becoming th from being things that you just have on your journal because you've written them down to things that you begin to say, God did this for me. God, God caused this to come uh, to pass. You see, he says in James chapter 4, verse number 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. When you draw near, when you begin responding to him, God responds to you. God responds to you. How you respond to God will always determine the kind of life that you end up living. Friend, won't you quickly invite him in 
Won't you let the Lord come in? Go, go ahead and invite him and say, God, I want for the rest of your life for you to dwell with me, to walk with me, to talk with me. Come and take over every area of my life and change everything, whatever it is that you desire. You see, when he comes, things will begin to change, to line up with his purposes and his will. He will begin to say, I don't like that. I don't like the conversations that you're having. I don't like what you're posting up on social media. I don't like the way you wear your socks. You know, he, he will begin to point things out. He'll begin to lead you in the direction that he wants you to go. Number two, in the text that we have read, Abraham was quick to give the best to God. He was quick to give his best to God. You know, check it out. I read it for us. He does not give God what they were eating. It was hot in the day. That's what the Bible said. It was hot in the day. I, I presume that was around midday. And Abraham was resting from stuff that he had been doing in the course of the day. Sarah was also resting. She was in the house. That means that, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the day was uh, gone. It was, uh, I, I believe, around midday. But he doesn't serve these visitors what they, had, what they were eating. They specially make something. Get some yogurt going. Get some bread baked. And I don't know about you, but I love myself some fresh bread. Oh, I love fresh bread. Are you kidding me? And that's what they received. And they get some very nice nyamachoma. Get some very nice nyamachoma. I have a problem because in the office I work with people who love meat. <laughs> and uh, when you go out for lunch, uh, you can see they're reporting themselves. When you go out for lunch, meat has always to be on the menu. Whether it's fish meat or chicken meat or goat meat or cow meat, they, there's always meat. And that's how Pastor Stratton gets his lemon and and shit is going. But I think they're in good company. Because that's what the Lord received. <laughs> are, are you getting me? He gives his best. He goes out of his way to ensure that he's generous to a cost. In fact, he doesn't count the cost. Very many times we count the cost of what it is that we're giving to the Lord. But I want to assure you, when you go through scripture and you find people who went above and beyond in giving God their best, God responded to them in ways that, that, that were just mind-blowing. Solomon, he offered to God a sacrifice on the altar on the day he was dedicating to the, the, the temple that was beyond anything Israel had ever done. And the Bible says God came down in his Shekinah glory. To the point where even the priests could not continue to offer sacrifices or move around. They had to fall down. They got slain right there. Are you getting what I'm saying? But that, that's what happens when you give God your best. When you, when you come to the place where you do not hold back, you do not count the cost. What about the woman with the alabaster jar of oil? It was expensive. It was so expensive that the disciples had a problem with it. He was their master. They had no problem with him uh, being called rabbi and teacher and, and bowing before him and all the other things that are done. But on this particular day, they had a problem. They were like, oh my goodness, this should have been sold and given to the poor. At that point in time, they began caring about the poor. Because they were concerned. I mean, remember, other times they were saying, send the people away. Just send the people away. Let them go and look for food for themselves. But on this particular day, Whatever it is that was poured. And I know sometimes we want to say it was uh, Judas who did it, but it wasn't just Judas. Other Gospels say the disciples. They murmured among, them, uh, among themselves. That's a kind of giving that I'm talking about. That you don't count the cost, you don't count the time. You know, when the Spirit of God nudges and wakes you up at, at around 1 a.m. in the night, you don't turn and say, oh no, it's too early, let me continue sleeping. You wake up and you seek the Lord. You have no idea why He's waking you up. God has trusted you enough to actually wake you up to pray for something. And go ahead and give Him your best. When God nudges you to give a, a certain amount of money, give it. Give it. Whatever it is that the Lord leads you and, and stars you, 
are towards. I, I, I'm calling us today to respond to this friend request. To respond to this God. Because when we do, He changes the quality of our lives. I don't know. I, I tend to believe. I, I, I tend to believe. You, you can disagree with me, but uh, this is what I believe. That if Abraham did not respond to God on this day, he would have continued living with a promise that, has, that is unfulfilled. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It would have continued just being a promise. You will have a son. But it was the response that caused God to come to the place of saying, this time next year. In fact, we know when you read the rest of the chapters that God was on his way to Sodom to destroy Sodom. But, but he appeared to Abraham to just see what will he do. And so he was standing nearby. And if Abraham had not responded, I believe God would have moved on. It's like Jesus passing by the disciples as they're struggling in the lake. He was going to pass by, but they cried out to him. They called out to him, and so he came uh, to them. And uh, a different day, uh, Peter simply said, you know what? I would rather be with you in the water facing the storm than in this boat with these losers crying and screaming. I don't want to be a loser anymore. And you and I need to come to the place where you, we simply say, I don't want what everyone else is experiencing. I want to go with God. I want to be who God wants me to be. I want to know God. I want to walk in His purposes. Are we together? Let's learn that lesson uh, from Abraham. Number three, he was quick to serve. He never allowed anyone else to serve. Not in a bad way, but Abraham knew, I cannot delegate I can't delegate my service to God. I can't delegate my relationship with God. I can't delegate my being a blessing to God. And interestingly, in, in this day and age, uh, you know, we, we tend to delegate things. Abraham had servants. I mean, Abraham would have lined up, sincerely speaking, Abraham would have lined up a hundred servants to serve these three visitors on that day. <laughs> because we know when, when Lot was attacked in Sodom, okay, and, and they were captured, Abraham had 300 men. We are not even counting the, 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 the children and the families. Because the culture then was, uh, you know, everyone in the family is, is, is a servant or a slave to, 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 to the man who owns uh, the, the wealth. Are you getting me? And so he would have, he would have given a charge to three, 300 of them and say, surround here. Whatever it is that they want, serve them. Whatever it is that they ask. In fact, be wiping their feet, comb their hair, do fan them because it was a hot day. He would have done all that. Into serving these three visitors, it's like Abraham said, this is mine. Just move away. I might be wealthy. I might be the man who is served by everyone else. But today I'm serving. Today I'm serving. That, that, that's how we need to respond to God. Never ever think that serving God is below you. Is below you. But... People tend to do that so easily. In fact, let me, let me, I, I know we have watched this video, but I'd like to play it I, even as we conclude it. I, I don't know whether Isaac, you have it ready. Just go ahead and uh, bring it up. Because I, I'd, I'd like us uh, to just, because we see this, we've seen it on social media, we've seen it on YouTube, and we've, we've passed it around, but, but there's a message in there that might not even be what you quickly see that I'd like us to see. And let's watch this. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? You're good. Yes, I am. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I've been seeing you several, eh? Uh huh. Uh, anytime I come here on Tuesday for prayers, eh? Mm -hmm. I see you doing some stuff with those guys, eh? Yeah, I usually clean. Yeah. I usually I... clean the sanctuary. On Tuesdays, right? Yeah, on Tuesdays. It touches me. Yeah, it's actually fulfilling to serve the Lord. Yeah. So, so this is my way of service to I've God. been thinking, eh? Uh-huh. How about I give you my card, eh? Yes. And uh, I'll just uh, find a job for you. I'm open to the idea. So that's good? Yes. All right. We can go. So let me pick uh, my card, eh? Okay, okay, no problem. Alright, this is my card. Uh-huh. 
You'll call me? I will for sure call you. You can just call me with any number there. Ah, okay. I think uh, I can just find your job. Uh, I guess on that note, probably should give you my business card. Oh, you have a card? Yes, I do. Let me just get it real quick from the car. Okay. Excuse, this is your car? Yes, this is one of my cars. Ha! Hi! Ah, uh, here's my business card. This is your car? Yes, it is. And you are sweeping, mopping the church. Hey! You are a CEO? Yes. It comes as a shock to you. And you're sweeping and mopping the church? Yes. Hi. Serve the Lord regardless of the position you hold, whether it is at work or in the community. Serve the Lord. Hey. You too uh -huh. should serve the Lord, my brother. Hey. I will. Okay. I will. I know we laugh at the guy, but think about it. How pervasive is, is that mentality? Think about it. You think that way the moment you assume, because you have known Christ for five years or ten years, you don't need to serve God, let the younger people serve. You have that mentality the moment you begin thinking, I am married now, I cannot serve, let other people serve. You have that mentality the moment you begin to assume, because of my position at work, because of the company that I run, because of the salary that I receive, let other people serve God. You have that mentality. You have that mentality the moment you begin to think that doing anything for God's kingdom and God's purposes is below you. I say Dalia, I repeat again. Abraham did need to be standing there, waiting, and giving the chilies and, 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 and the limao, and washing the hands, and ministering to his servants, uh, to, to his visitors. He had more than three servants, uh, 300 hand servants who would have done that. How many do you have? He had more than 300 servants who would have served that day. He did not need to be running around. He would have sat at his tent and called one of his servants and say, who are those visitors? Invite them in. He did not need to run. But what we see is Abraham quickly served. He quickly gave his best. He quickly welcomed God in. May we be quick in responding to God. Heavenly Father, it's my prayer that you will help us to be a people that serve you and are people that do it quickly. I pray that we will be a people that are quick in giving you our best, are people that are quick in inviting you in, that will not delay when it comes to you, that will not delay when you speak to us, when you lead us in a direction, because our, at the quality of our lives, our timelines will be changed radically based on how we respond to you. And my prayer is that here at ICC Mombasa will be a people that respond to the the Lord. And I know that as we do this, Lord, as we are quick in seeking you, are quick inviting you, quick serving you, quick Jehovah God in giving you our best, we will see you showing up and beginning to pick up the promises and things that you have declared and called us for. Papa says that Father you ordained us for and you will begin to say, this is going to happen now. I pray that this month of May will be totally different. We will back the purposes of God as we quickly begin to respond to you, our King and our Father. Lord, may, we, may it never be said of us that we did not serve God. May it never be said of us that we held back anything from you. May it never be said that we do not welcome you in. Because you stand at the door and you knock. And you knock. And as you're praying today, church, I'd like to ask, before we say an amen to this prayer, are you here and you would say, you know what, Pastor, I have not invited God in when he has been knocking at the door of my heart. I've never given my life to Jesus Christ that he may be my Lord and my Savior. I'd like to pray together with you today. If you lift up and say it's me, here I am, pray together with me. 
Or maybe you gave your life to Christ, but you've been in control of your life. You do whatever it is that you want. And today you're saying, I'm submitting myself wholly and completely to the Lordship of Jesus. I'd like to pray together with you, dear that person. Thank you for that hand. Anyone else who raise their hand and say, it's me, here I am. Would you pray with me? Thank you, I see your hand. Anyone else? Anyone else? Just go ahead and raise up your hand. Let me pray together with you today. You're giving your life to Jesus, or you're saying, I want you as Lord in my life from here going forward. I don't want to be in control of my life anymore. Would you go ahead and just raise up your hand and join together with these two that have lifted up their hands? Anyone else who will join together with these two? I'd like to pray together with you at this point. Tell me, Father, I pray for these two dear ones that have raised up their hand. I commit them into your hands and I pray for the working of your Holy Spirit and the ministry of your Spirit upon their lives. I pray that, Lord, you may forgive them of their sin, wash them with your blood, and cause them to be who you created them to be. I pray that they will live for you. They will know you. They will walk in your purposes and they will be changed by the power of your Spirit. I lift them up before you, O oh God, and I thank you for them. As you're still praying, I'd like to ask those of you who lifted up your hand, just look at me. Just look at me. Here's what I'd like you to do. Rise up on your feet and walk up to the side and you will meet with Shiko right there. Uh, Pastor Shiko will be right there with you uh, to, to, to meet together with you and to talk with you. Uh, you just do that. Just rise up and, and, and do that. Uh, she's walking through the door so you can uh, follow her uh, through the door. You can actually carry everything that you have and we praise the Lord for doing you to himself today. We bless his holy name. There is no other God that can would you go ahead and just put uh, your hands together and give him another round of applause? I'd like to ask before we conclude this prayer time are you here and you're saying, Pastor, my problem has been service? I have not been serving, but I'm raising up my hand today and I'm making a commitment that I will serve the Lord and I will respond to Him quickly. I will give him my best, my strength, my abilities, everything. Just raise up your hand and we pray together with you. You're saying, I will serve you, Lord. I will serve you. From here going forward, I will serve you. Heavenly Father, I pray with the men and women that are lifting up their hands. I pray that you will take a hold of their hands and you will lead them. You will show them where it is that you want them to serve. You will open their eyes and you will cause them, Jehovah God, to serve you with diligence, with commitment, with dedication. And may their lives be changed even as they do this. I pray, Father, for your blessing and favor upon their lives. For I commit them into your hands. And I bless this congregation. I bless these men and women. I pray that, Father, they may experience you. Just like I prayed before, I pray again. Help us to be quick in responding to you. So that you may change our timeline for the glory and praise of your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Rise up on your feet. I'd like to release you, even as you go. And uh, I want you to say this. Last week, I remember when we were talking about our giving, uh, during our giving time, I said, let's do something this month. Let, 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 let's, uh, on the first of the month, what the first thing that we do when we receive our income or whatever else, what did we say we will do? We will give. So I encourage you to go downstairs, you know, because you will give to God first. You will give to God what is best. You know, I just go downstairs, you will find uh, uh, somebody waiting for you at the guest relations desk. Go ahead and give and, and be uh, generous beyond your wildest imaginations. I bless you today. I bless you to walk in God's purposes. I bless you to experience God as a friend. I bless you to uh, walk in His will, to hear His voice, to know Him personally like Abraham knew the Lord. I bless you. To experience the God of heaven and earth in every area of your life. And may he make his face to shine upon you. May he give you peace. May he surround you with his favor. And may he guide you in all that he has for you. It was a pleasure having you here. And uh, may the Lord be with you.